All right. Welcome. Welcome to ELE 201, Information Signals. This class will be, for some of you, it will be your favorite undergrad class, I hope. It was for me and, it, and several people I know. Um, the topic is very interesting. And uh, come on in. Filter in. We're going to use up all the seats, so just uh, climb in the middle. All right, so um, I was saying this class will be, for some of you, will be your favorite, I hope. And for some of you, will, you'll find it difficult because it's got a lot of math, all right? There's no way to cheat the math, but um, what we'll try to do is make it interesting uh, for all of you. Make it eye-opening, what you can do with these tools. Uh, we have, of course, the material that you'll, you'll learn in the lecture. We also have some very interesting labs that you'll do that'll hopefully bring these to reality. So when uh, something that's not uncommon is that a, a lot of you will be, find yourselves two weeks into the class saying, what are we really doing? And you still won't know because uh, maybe I have said it, but it doesn't quite sink in. And then at some point, you know, you'll be learning the material and then you'll realize Oh, wow, oh, I finally get it. I see what this applies to, why we're learning this. I experienced the same thing. I'm not sure what it is about this material. You learn some math, and then at some point you realize why this is so cool and why you can apply it to a bunch of things. So what I'll start off right now uh, talking about is what an information signal is. Yep, sorry that you have to cram into the middle. Maybe next time we can start seating from the middle out. Okay, um, so uh, here I have just an example of some some signal uh, that it looks very chaotic, okay? The blue is the, let's say, the original signal. It's very chaotic. And um, whatever this represents, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an audio signal, or I'm not going to even worry about what it is right now. There's a lot of things you might want to do with such a signal. One thing might be that you want to kind of represent it with a smoother signal. You want to get rid of the noise and say, what is the real essence of the signal? So this red line that you might be able to see here is, uh, represents a smoother version of the blue line. Okay, uh, So this would be called smoothing. Um, what might you do to create smoothing? Aside from drawing by eye, that gets tedious after a while. right? So what might you do mathematically to smooth the signal? Let's just throw out some ideas um, of what you might do. Yes? A low-pass filter. That's, that's going to be exactly relevant to this course. We're going to learn all about that. Um, where do you experience low-pass filters in the past? Is it from a course or from 203 circuits? Exactly. I was hoping that some of you would, would have experienced low-pass, high-pass filters from, say, your circuits course. Okay. The, the, math and the, um, yeah, the math tools we learn here are going to even help solidify what you learned in your circuits course. All right. So you could do a low-pass filter. Uh, any other ideas? So what, what uh, maybe even, it may even be the same idea, but described in different words. What, any ideas of what to do here? Yes. Okay, so you, it seems like you've mentioned two things. Averaging locally, okay, some sort of moving average. That's a great idea. And that also is going to be directly related to what we do here. Because when you do a local averaging, that process uh, is is both linear and shift invariant, and and you know, about three weeks into the class here, we're going to talk a lot about doing any sort of linear time invariant processing, and how the tools we learn are going to directly apply to that. Now, the other thing you said was like subsampling, just taking a sample here and there, and those are going to do two, two very different things. If you the the red here is probably not a subsampling because subsampling would still get some very high values and some very low values. Okay. Um, but actually, even today, I have an example of doing, doing that. All right. Uh, there are other ideas um, that I can think of. Anyone else want to throw out one? So it's similar to local averaging, but rather than averaging, what might you do locally? So one, one popular idea is to use a median, local median. Okay. Some of you may call median an average, but... I mean, the difference between mean and median. Median means look, take the middle value of everything you've seen locally and replace the value with that middle value. Okay, so the, that sort of median filter, it has a lot of applications. 
However, it, the effect of a median filter is not going to be analyzed well by what we learn in this class. So, of course, what we learn here is going to be limited. It's very broad, but it doesn't cover everything that you might do in signal processing. Okay. So, still staying very abstract. I have, we haven't even given examples of signals. Um, but a signal really is just anything that comes from, let's say, sensors. Okay. Those sensors could be... Um, a microphone, that's a sensor. Video camera, uh, could be a temperature sensor, could be a speed sensor in the car, let's say. Okay. And this signal, usually it has, uh, it, it maybe time is the uh, independent axis of your signal. It doesn't have to be, but often it is. And so these sensors might be sensing over time, and, and that the value they sense fluctuates. And there, there's your information signal. All right. Now, Often, when you put, you have automated systems that both sense and act on what they've sensed. Okay, and that's what this picture is depicting. So we have sensors that go into some information processing box, some technology, that's going to drive some actuators. Maybe that's a motor, um, any number of things. And, we'd, and we want to talk about what, what you might design this information processing box to do. Or maybe you have some physical box that's actually, uh, you know, in some real system, and you want to understand what it's doing, rather than design. You're not engineering the box; you're actually given a box, and you want to understand what it does to these signals, whether it's going to, uh, once you get to the motors, whether it's going to behave well or not. Okay, a simple example of this sort of automated setting would be, let's say, um, speed control in a car. You can turn on the cruise control button. And of course, the cruise control is going to sense the speedometer, and, and it has some target speed, and it's going to push your accelerator or let it off to try to keep you at that target speed. All right. Now that may seem like not very sophisticated technology, because if you've ever been in, you know, used to your cruise control, you can feel what it's doing, and it's very simple. You know, if it's going too slow, it speeds you up, and, and so forth. Of course, there are some details there. Uh, how much is it going to try to speed you up, you know, to stay at that target speed? And if it's done wrong, it's possible for it to uh, oscillate and become even unstable. It speeds up and then passes its target and comes back down and so forth. Um, and so when, when such a thing is designed, you don't want it to be unstable. You want it to just gradually get back to the, to the right speed. Now, you're going to encounter this. If you're electrical engineering majors, so you're going to take uh, 302, which is car lab, next year. And one of the first things you're going to do is try to get the car to drive at a constant speed, whether it's going up a hill or down a hill or whatever, using the, the speed sensor. And you'll experience that you can do this wrong, especially when you're trying to update the speed so quickly and accurately. You can, you can create an unstable system. But the, the, the tools of what we'll learn here um, will help you to know, even before you try it out, whether or not it's going to work, all right, and, and what, what's going to happen when you implement your, your information processing. All right, so some examples of signals. Here are some image examples. Those are signals. Now, images, I've been talking about signals that have, like, time as the independent axis. Okay, those would be one-dimensional signals, which we're going to focus on mostly. But images uh, are two-dimensional. You have just, you have a two-dimensional space, and each point in that space has a value. Okay, maybe if it's a color image, each point in that space actually has a three-dimensional value. But let's just think about black and white. Every point in your space has a number that says how bright it is. All right? And uh, so your signal has a two-dimensional independent axis, uh, and axes, and then the third dimension is the value of your signal at those points. Now, here's an example of uh, some signal processing. This is deblurring. Okay, these are all supposed to be examples of uh, an image that was blurry, and you're trying to then recover a better image from it. All right, something that your, your phones try to do and have been for you know, this type of technology has been around. and being perfected for a long time. So we see, um, okay, we see that it's very hard to make out anything from this label. And you apply an a algorithm that's going to go through and do some computation and produce this image, all right, which is still not great. A lot of artifacts, but much better than this. All right. So in these examples of deep learning, you can see both the effectiveness and also the limitations of uh, of current state-of-the-art technology for deep learning. Um, this example here, I, I 
read was actually fake. This is Adobe actually presented this in. Uh, so Adobe, of course, has Photoshop. They have lots of cool tools for doing all sorts of image processing. Apparently, they presented this as an example of what they can do, and it was later learned that they, they fudged it a little bit. It's not actually pure deep blurring. So you see that the, the, there's still work to be done on, on you know, doing deep blurring. And as was mentioned, I was talking to one of the students in here before class started. Of course, some information is lost in a blurry image. And you can't necessarily expect to recover everything perfectly. So it's really a matter of doing the most with the information you have, right? All right. Another example of signal processing, let's say touch surfaces. Um, of course, you have sensors in the surface, uh, which, you know, the behavior of the sensor can be studied and perfected by uh, device engineers who are trying to get the best signal out of these sensors. But in the end, you actually get a good working product by, on top of that, applying the right signal processing that tries to learn, you know, how to interpret the, the uh, sensor measurements to try to narrow down where the finger actually is. And whether something is a finger or just a stray, you know, your, your palm touching the, the, the uh, screen. And whether the sequence of where you move your finger can be used to further predict and, and do spell correcting and things like that. Okay. Another application of signal processing is radar and tracking. There's a big research area still trying to do this very well. Um, what you have, the raw signal you get from radar is that you send out an electromagnetic wave, a radio wave. It bounces back from an object, and you can use all sorts of things to try to figure out how far away that object was. How long did it take? Right? How fast is it moving? Well, um, a number of ways to do this, but one is to look at the Doppler shift. Uh, did the frequency go up or down after it bounced off of them? And you can get a Doppler shift and, and see how is it moving towards you or away. And then you do more sophisticated thing with this radar. You try to track objects. You say, I know there are only three objects out there. Of course, when I send a radar signal out and it comes back, there's going to be lots of little artifacts and noise and things I don't actually want to track. And so I can use the locations from one point to the next to try to follow an object um, and, uh, and track it. Okay? And this is all applications of, of signal processing. A lot of it using directly using what we'll, what we'll learn here. And then, of course, there are parts that we're not going to get to. Um, digital communication. So again, you're transmitting waves. Uh, if it's wireless, your cell phones are transmitting waves through, through the room. They get picked up by some base station. Um, and uh, those, there's a lot of signal processing to, uh, for example, remove the effect of multiple echoes. So, so there's not just one path for your cell phone to reach the base station. It's going to bounce off off other reflecting objects, and many versions will be received at the other end. And um, an important part of signal processing is this e dealing with echoes. How do you kind of cancel out echoes? All right. Um, how should you design the communication waveform so that it best, so that it will behave best as it goes through this uh, the system? The system being everything it takes to get your signal from from your location to the destination. All right, and you go through this, uh, what we would call a channel. Um, but we can abstractly just view that as a big system, and we want to know how is the signal going to be affected by that system? How can it be designed to be, uh, to be most robust to whatever that system is going to do to it? All right. Um, OK, another cool application of signal processing of what we'll learn in this class. We won't learn MRI, but we will learn all of, almost all of the tools that are used for medical imaging. In particular, MRI is a very cool uh, mode of imaging because it uses some really cool physics. Okay, so ma magnetic resonance, uh, resonance imaging um, involves putting an object in a very strong magnetic field. All right, and rather than, so most Medical imaging, like let's say X-ray or uh, so or, or uh, ultrasound, involve sending a wave like an X-ray into the object and sensing how it either reflects or how it goes through. Okay, it's pretty straightforward to understand how that works. It's like you're looking at a shadow if it's X-ray. With MRI, it's very different. You put the object in this um, in this very strong magnet. You hit it with some very 
very weak little um, signal that's meant to to knock your water molecules out of alignment magnetically with the, with this magnetic field that it's in. What happens is the physics when you put uh, when you put this water molecule in a strong magnetic field, it rotates its magnetic alignment until it lines up with the magnetic field. But while it's rotating, it emits a signal. Okay, you can think of it like singing. So you get all of your, uh, usually water is what's targeted in MRI. You get all of these water molecules to sing out at you. All right, and the key then, the way that they get an image out of this, because if you, if you, uh, if all you get is a bunch of bunch of singing coming out of a body and you record it, well, how do you know where it came from, right? Um, so what they actually do is have a different strength magnetic field at each point in the space, okay? So they call that the gradient. They put some gradient on the magnetic field. That's going to cause the water to sing at a different pitch, depending on where it is. So now what you record on your antenna is all of this singing water, except for it's all singing at different pitches. And now you can actually use the pitch to determine where it came from. Okay, so actually we will, um, if there's time, uh, on the lecture before the midterm, at least that's what I did last year, we'll, we'll actually look at MRI a little bit more detail, just as a fun application. It's not something that you're going to be tested on in this class, but it is, I think it's a really cool application of signal processing. It turns out, so the, the big word that we are going to study through and through in this class is the Fourier transform. How many people feel like they know the Fourier transform already? Uh, there's always there's always some. Okay, it's a really I mean if if you do you probably know how how cool it is. It's a very very fun tool, and that's really what we're going to spend a lot of time understanding. Well, it turns out it uh, is a tool that's used in all of these things. In MRI, it, it's it's funny. It's like physics was built exactly for the Fourier transform. What they read out on this antenna, literally. They just could type in Fourier, you know, FFT, a fast Fourier transform, into their software, and boom, out comes the image they wanted. It's pretty amazing. Okay, that just happens. That's just kind of a weird application where where it fits so naturally. But we're going to find that it's it's uh, useful in, in many of these problems we've talked about. All right, another thing that you could do with images, something like learning, like uh, face recognition. Here I'm having just various examples of of machine learning. Machine learning, of course, there's many things in machine learning that are not going to be related at all to this class, but yet some of the signal processing would be a first step in various machine learning tools like face recognition and so forth. Okay. Here's a stock, stock prices. I don't remember when I grabbed this. It might have been like a year ago or something. Okay. Um, so this is a signal. Um, and uh, something you might want to do with this, there's many things you might want to do with this signal, probably the most common, is to try to predict. All right, you want to predict stock prices, and that's yet something that you can somewhat address with the types of tools we'll, we'll learn here. Of course, you're, so many people know these things that you're not going to actually make money on the stock market using what I teach you, probably. But... Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but anyway, predict, prediction, all sorts of signals um, people try to predict, and one of the first things that they'll try to do is use a linear predictor, which is exactly addressed by the stuff we're going to talk about here. Um, so hopefully I've given you the sense that a signal is really anything. In fact, in generality, we would say a, a signal is a function. All right, um, A one-dimensional signal is just a one-dimensional function and is meant to represent something. It usually represents some some time varying sensor measurement, but the, the independent axis doesn't have to be time. It could be space. It could be the the temperature of a pipe along its length or something. And that's a signal, all right. And then and so we'll often uh, be just talking about signals in the abstract sense, and it's just an arbitrary function. And we'll see what we can do with them. Oh, well, here's another example. Again, we're getting back to physical um, signals and systems. So here I've drawn, I have a car, um, and I've emphasized the suspension of the car. Okay. So one thing we'd like to know is how does a system um, affect a signal? Okay. So often these systems, whether it's a physical system like a car or something that's been designed, 
have inputs. These are the sensor measurements. They have outputs. Maybe they're driving a motor is the output. Maybe it's just something physical, like the location of the object is the output signal. And um, we'd like to understand how is the output going to behave given certain inputs. We'd like to get a nice intuitive understanding of how the system is going to affect signals. So as an example, let's look at um, this uh, car here. Okay, and along comes the speed bump. Okay, so now this is uh, what I, I've drawn the ground, but we can think about that the height of the ground as a signal, okay, in our abstract sense, that um, we have uh, the independent variable is, is, you know, position, and vertical is the height of the road, okay, and then basically that's the graph, it's way up here, okay. That's what we ha we have a graph of our signal. Now, why is this a signal? Well, the reason I want to interpret this as a signal is the following: because these wheels are going to hit, they're going to follow the ground, right? And so um, we could likewise represent another graph. It's going to be exactly the same, where time is our independent variable, and height of the wheel. The height of the wheel is what we're graphing here. So it's another signal. Okay, we've gone from the road to the wheel. And it's going to be exactly the same with some shift, you know. I don't know how much. Okay. So we're going to get something like that. It's going to follow the contour of the road. Now, the car is made to not move completely rigidly with the ground. Okay. The suspension is going to somehow absorb this shock. For a couple of reasons. One reason is for your comfort, okay, as you're driving, to make it very comfortable. Another reason is to keep the, the wheels on the road for handling. Okay, so the car suspension is in a sense going to process the signal, and let me call the output of this system the height of the car itself, not the wheels. Okay, and this will do something like this. It'll Maybe be delayed slightly before it starts moving, and then it'll go up, and maybe you'll get some sort of vibration. Maybe not. Depends on the hand, the uh, suspension of your car, whether it vibrates or just damps. But you'll get some effect of the wheels were, were hit and the car moved. All right. And um, this system, it's funny because physics is what's uh, this system is made completely from physics. It's not. It doesn't have to be an electronic system, right? But yet. Yet we're still able to talk about it in the same framework of signals. The system is a suspension and outcomes. Uh, another signal, and we want to understand it. Believe it or not, um, most uh, at least the basic uh, analysis of how suspension works is going to look a lot like how circuits work, and it's going to the tools that we learn are going to fit exactly into that type of analysis okay. to understand is it what it's going to do. To the signal. All right, so there we go. Circuits also. Maybe some of you have seen circuits like this. And this would be a, uh, what, a high pass filter. No, this is going to be a low pass filter, right? And um, anyway, um, you're not expected to be masters of circuits here. I will bring it into some of the lectures. But the physics of the circuits is a lot like the physics of the suspension on the car. Okay, there's a very fun um, application of signal processing in control. Many of you are probably interested in robotics and control. Uh, how many people have ridden on a Segway? Uh, only a few. Raise the hands high. Come on, how many? All right, less than half, though. It's very fun, right? Um, so, you know, these Segways balance you. And you, you get a nice expression on your face like this guy when you write it. Um, so uh, the, the, the control, uh, so the segue is sensing your, your, the angle and trying to balance using just, it's balancing on a wheel, right? Uh, and so it's going to move you forward or backward to keep you balanced. And it does it very quickly. It does a good job of keeping, keeping you upright. This is actually a very famous uh, problem in control. 
It's called the inverted pendulum problem. Okay, you have a pendulum that's not swinging down but swinging up. You're, you 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 can't control it by holding it. It's just on a hinge, but you can move to try to balance it. It's like holding a broomstick. We've all done, and um, and you can if the broomstick's very long, you can do it yourself pretty easily. If it's short, you have a hard time. And uh, you can also get a computer to do it. If it can sense the angle, just like you do with your eyes, then it can tell it doesn't need to move here or there to catch this, this pendulum. It's exactly what the Segway is doing. But it's actually a very classical problem in control and in signal processing. And in fact, we have an inverted pendulum apparatus here, and I'll bring it into the lecture sometime towards the end of class. And we're going to write code to balance the pendulum. Uh, it's, it's a very fun exercise. Uh, and what you want is, and here, it's very easy to write code that doesn't work right, that that overcompensates and causes the thing to fall. All right. And so what you want is to get it to do very smoothly the way the Segway does. Let's watch this. Um, oh, I wonder uh, how I get this link. Just a second. Here's a fun uh, example of something similar in control. Meet Switchblade, a unique agile robot from the Coordinated Robotics Lab at UC San Diego. The treads provide traction over a variety of terrain, but Switchblade has another trick up its sleeve. Each tread assembly can pivot relative to the central chassis. We can use this ability to change the center of mass and climb over obstacles. Using internal sensors, we can also balance on the end of the treads and stand upright. Pretty cool how smooth it looks. You don't see it trying really hard to stay up. It just does. All right. So that's a cool example, and you can see how this is used in control. All right. Sound is going to be a common example we look to in this class because it's one dimensional. It's something we can we can literally hear the effect of our processing. Uh, I can do demos in class, and you can work with it uh, in lab. So we're going to do a lot of stuff with sound. Um, and in fact, I'm going to do something with sound right now as a demo. But I think I have one more slide, so let's do this last slide first. Okay, one thing, and this is sort of. Uh, segue into what we will do next lecture, okay? Um, and that is uh, the idea of taking a signal that may look complicated like this and realizing we can represent it in a simpler way. Okay, so you look at this. This may be um, someone's voice. Uh, whatever it is, um, actually, I mean, I just created this signal, so it's not anything really. But uh, it's... But if have any of you played with audio, uh, you know, recorded a voice or looked at, uh, you know, looked at graphs of what audio sounds like, uh, it looks like? I I remember when I was an undergrad, I used to look, play with the oscilloscope because uh, we were doing amplifiers, right? So we would, so you'd make these amplifiers, and in the end, I just wanted to hook to the oscilloscope and look at my what my voice was like, and what if I whistled, and what if I made different vowel sounds? How does it change? And um, and you you find that you know if you the pitch is determined by this fund by, of, say, something like voice, it's determined by its repeating time, right? So we see that it repeats about three times in this graph here. Roughly repeats. It may not be exactly the same. Um, and 
so that repeating determines the pitch that you hear, but the shape of it is going to determine what kind of sound you're hearing. And um, it turns out that um, it's often very, very convenient and useful, especially for sound, but for all sorts of things, to separate this signal into a sum of simpler signals. Okay. For example, sinusoid. All right. So this is not a sinusoid, but in fact, it's the sum of the three sinusoids. Okay, so these three, different color here, they're different frequencies, they're different amplitudes, different shit, all right? But when you sum them up, you get the one above, which, you know, may not be obvious right now how I could go from the image above, from that signal, to splitting it into these signals, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about next time, and that's what the Fourier transform is all about. Um, a method of splitting signals into their, um, the, to the frequencies that they're composed from. And we're going to, of course, learn why we would do such a thing, how we do it, um, how, we, how we apply this. Now, with hearing, it turns out that uh, your ears are sensitive to this sort of um, to frequency. So this splitting it up into frequencies is exactly, uh, that's exactly identifying what your ears are going to hear. Okay, your ear is going to hear these three pitches um, at different volumes. And, in fact, your ears are very good at identifying that since they're multiple frequencies of each other, they probably came from one voice at, at a certain frequency and so forth. So your ears do some processing, but really they, all, they pick up the frequency. The ear doesn't actually pick up the phase very much. The phase would be how, how much shifted each of these sinusoids is. Your ear doesn't care much about that. All right. Now, if I shifted one of these sinusoids and then re-added them together, I could get this thing to look much different than it looks right now. It could look very different, unrecognizable. You wouldn't maybe by eye you wouldn't know it's the same three uh, frequencies added together. And all all I did was I shifted one of them. All right. So it's useful to not look at signals in this domain, but instead look at them as a sum of different frequencies. That's that's often very useful. Okay, so anyway, let me get to, let me get to something more um, more hands-on here. Not that. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna open up a audio processing software. This is Audacity. It's open source, um, and I'll read in one of the uh, files that it comes with Windows. Okay, they have some, some sound files here. Okay, um, so what has it done? It's showing me a graph of these sounds. All right, it's showing me two of them. Why two? Got one up here and one down here. Two channels. Yeah, stereo means you have two, two channels so that you can have different sounds going to each of them to kind of steer the music one, one way or another. Okay, so stereo music is going to have two different channels. Now, you can see they're very similar, right? I mean, at least at this level, but let's zoom in a little bit and see that they are, in fact, quite similar. You know, the, the, you, I mean, of course, there are little differences you might be able to notice. I think. I think I noticed some before. I mean, it's possible they're exactly the same. Um, no, but I think they're actually slightly different. But, you know, usually with music, you're hearing pretty much the same thing out of both speakers. And there will be just subtle differences. Um, okay, so I want to show we can zoom in to a shorter time time window. Let's let me select. Let me zoom out a little bit. Select this, and we can play just that portion. Oops. What happened? Should be playing all right. Is it playing out of here or there? <laughs> I think here, right? Oh, well, you can hear it. All right, now what I can do is, um, what I want to show you with this, that's pretty cool, is, well, first of all, actually, okay, so we said this is a graph of the sound, but what does that actually mean? Someone want to take a stab at what, in fact, I'm going to open up writing pad here. Oops, not that one. 
going to open this up and draw, an, and we'll we'll draw some things here. All right. What we we're seeing is a sound wave. I'll just say something like that. What does that mean? What are what are the axes here? What what is this graph representing? Time. Okay. And what's this one? I hear a bunch of things. Okay, there's a lot of answers that are correct, actually. What were you going to say? Volume. Okay. Um, let's say, let me list some things that would work here. So, voltage works. Um, um, could say air pressure. Now, I won't put volume just because volume has a connotation of like how loud it is. Usually for volume, people kind of uh, do some sort of processing to estimate the volume. For example, just because it hits, so, so I drew the time axis down here, but let's say zero is right. Zero usually goes right through the middle of the sound wave, right? Just because it's zero right there doesn't mean the volume is zero right there, right? It's, it could be, it's in the middle of a loud sound. Um, so you might say it's amplitude, whatever that means. Um, Okay, so why are all these things accurate descriptions of what this wave is? Well, because they all think about this wave representing some physical, something actually physically happening. Okay, so first of all, you have you have someone speaking, right? Okay, and you know, sounds coming out. All right, and so at this point, you have pressure waves, right? That's what sound actually is as it travels to you. All right, travels usually through the air, maybe through something else to get to you. There's pressure waves. So at that point, the signal, you could think of this signal that we have stored on the computer here. Remember, we've got a picture of our signal. But this is supposed to represent those pressure waves. Fine. Um, then what's going to happen is going to be picked up by some microphone. And, um, well, it immediately turns into a motion. So, say motion of the diaphragm of the microphone. Okay, so you could also think the signal is representing where that microphone is positionally. From there, what? It goes to, uh, there's a coil on the diaphragm and another coil, and it creates some electromagnetic coupling. So for a brief moment, it's electromagnetic. And then it becomes a voltage on the wire. Okay. And um, if, this is, if each of these pieces is designed well, the signal does not change much from one to the next. We imagine it's the same signal at all of these places because that's the job of a microphone and that's you know is to just convert the signal from air pressure to voltage all right without changing it now in reality it's going to change it slightly and so an engineer has to des design it so that it doesn't change it much all right there is some some inadvertent signal processing going on there some analog signal processing now it could be that this just is going to go straight to a speaker you know maybe a loudspeaker maybe it's at some concert and that the entire way, it was just an analog signal, okay? Meaning it was converted to different mediums, but it always looked the same. If you put the right sensor in there, you would see the same graph over time pretty much, right? And then it becomes pressure again out here, right? Sound. I'm writing sound, but of course we need pressure. Okay, so, um, but in fact, how did I get it on the computer? Well, the, we didn't just leave it as an analog signal. We actually, um, in our case, we actually sample. So we put it into, well, I'll just write this as an A to D converter, analog to digital converter. That's actually made out of transistors that are going to compare the voltage on the wire to a bunch of other, to millions of, of target voltages. And it's going to say that voltage is closest to this one. And and then it's going to write that as a number. 
okay, in memory. Okay, so, all right, so it's going to write that as a number. Of course, it's going to then measure it again moments later. It's going to do this tens of thousands of times each second, measure again, and get a new number. It's going to have a sequence of numbers. That's called sampling, all right, and I store those in memory. And now we have what we refer to as a digital signal, okay? So you, could, you can do signal processing completely analog. In other words, you can actually put circuits here, you know. Insert analog signal processing. Okay, you could put a low-pass filter, high-pass filter. Think about on the stereo system. Maybe, maybe you have an old stereo system that has nothing digital in it. And just um, and it has a button that says boost the bass. Okay, that can be done without ever sampling it and making it digital. What it can do is it can feed it into a, a circuit that's a low pass circuit, and you usually identify lower sounds as the bass part of music. And so then it feeds it into this low pass filter, and it does an amplifier and mixes it back in. That can all be done in analog. You don't need to ever make ever sample and make it a digital signal to do that. Or you can do, but you can also do all these things with digital signals. So out comes he, out of this ADC. There's a bunch of numbers. I'll just okay. So a bunch of bits come out. Of course, then it usually we're going to later want to play this out of a, some system. So you'll have bits come in uh, to some digital to analog converter which is going to have a waveform come out, and then maybe it'll play it out of the speaker. And you can do processing to the numbers in between, and that's digital signal processing. Okay, that's what we're going to do in this class because it's, uh, you know, it's very handy. We're going to do that with, I'm not saying that this class only focuses on digital signal processing, but I mean for your labs, okay, and for my demos, I'm, we're going to use digital sound. You're going to use wave, sound file, and you're going to do some processing to them. The, the, the math we learn here is going to apply to analog and digital and everything. Okay, so let's just prove what I said here. We have this audacity. Uh, we, we're looking at a signal, right, a sound wave. And I'm going to zoom in really far. And if I zoom far enough, it's going to show me actual dots. Can you see dots? I know this projector is not the greatest. But you can see some dots. Let me zoom in just a little further. Okay, yeah, well, you see all these straight lines that are, have sharp corners. That's just because the software connects the dots. Okay, the, the lines in between don't actually mean anything. The, the location of the dots are what, the, what is actually recorded. Okay, but a sequence of numbers that's supposed to represent this, what it sampled at each point in time. Okay, now you can actually do something as silly as moving these things. In fact, you know, I can do that. Okay. Let me do a little more over here. Let me play it back. Now it's going to play a larger segment. This segment's way too short. You know, you wouldn't even be able to hear anything. But um, let me zoom back out, and you see what. So, what do you think is going to happen when it? You're going to have to listen very close if you try to hear that. But I can't even tell where it was. How do we scroll here? I think my segment's too long. It helps if I pick a shorter one. Okay. Let me do this. Let's do some more yet. Creative editing here. It won't let me edit individual pixels unless I'm zoomed in far enough. No. Oh, I have to be able to see the dots. Okay, do it one more time. Okay, I'll be both. Okay, so now. Um, 
All right. See if we hear it. What, what should it sound like? Any idea? What? Um, perhaps. So let's take a look. It's, well, you know, it's actually pretty fast moving compared to these regions. So maybe that would be kind of higher. Actually, it's so short, it's going to hardly sound like anything but a click. Okay, so we might hear like a in there. And that, that would be it, basically. Let's see if maybe you do. Heard it in the middle. Okay. So it's just short. I'll do one more time. Yeah, you hear it there. It's just a little glitch. All right. So this won't be the most effective way to do signal processing by hand. But we can write code that does all sorts of whatever we can imagine. Right. So let me next introduce you to MATLAB, which you are going to, whoops, that's not it. You are going to use MATLAB. I'm guessing most of you haven't yet. How many people have used MATLAB? Okay. More than Segway. All right. So <laughs> um, MATLAB is, is useful. To, it's a pretty simple uh, programming environment. Uh, it can do anything you want. It just generally won't run as fast as something like C. It won't run nearly as fast. But it's very fast for prototypes. And it has a lot of signal processing tools built into it. Uh, it's used a lot for signal processing and for linear algebra. So you can actually, in research and in development in industry, there's a lot of use of MATLAB because you can prototype it. We're going to just exclusively use MATLAB because we're not going to. Usually you, you use MATLAB to develop what you're trying to develop, and then if you're going to actually make a product, then you go code it in something that's faster, right? But we're never going to have to worry about that in this class. So you can do a lot with MATLAB, and you're going to be doing it in your weekly labs. Let me show you what happens if I read in. So I wrote just a little script here. Okay, there are two ways to use MATLAB. You can just type things in directly to a command line. Here's a command line. I've already typed several things into it. I can type like, I can create like a vector 1 through 4, 1 through 3, 4. Okay. I can save it as variables. I can do any command I want from the command line. Um, you know, I can see here's the variables I have saved. I can reuse them and so forth. I can also write a sequence of commands and save it as a file, which is what this is. So I wrote this sequence of commands just so I wouldn't have to type it all in front of you right now. Um, and this is what it's going to do. It's going to read in another sound clip that comes from Windows. <laughs> All right, and uh, it, it's an MP3, and I have a, a handy little command called MP3 read, which, by the way, if you try to do this at home, MATLAB doesn't have MP3 read built in. It has wave read, so you can read wave files. You have to go find MP3 read off the internet. Someone wrote a, some code that will allow it to read MP3s, and, and I have those files, and we'll, we'll make them available to you as well. Okay. So it reads it in and saves it as this variable y. OK. I'm going to run this whole thing, and then we'll take a look at y. So I can go over here, and I can look at y. Now, I'm not going to want to, you know, I'm not going to, want to actually have it list out all the numbers in y. And here's, here's the reason. All right, let's say size of y. So y is 7 million samples long, and um, so it's not going to do me any good to look at the actual numbers, all right? It also has a sample rate associated with the MP3. I saved that as the variable fs, 44,100 samples per second, okay? That's the rate at which these samples were taken. Does anyone recognize that number? If you're familiar, yeah, go ahead. Yes, that's, that's correct, because the upper limit of hearing is about 20 kilohertz. And if you double that, you get to 40. And you're familiar with this, the NyQuil sampling theorem, which you don't have to know yet. We're going to cover this in the class. Um, and that is that to capture sound, you should sample at twice the highest frequency. OK, so you're right. That is approximately that. And there's another reason you might recognize this exact number. Does anyone recognize? This is the CD audio, CD clock. Uh, yeah, CD quality audio just samples at this rate. Okay, DVD is very similar as well. DVD audio, I think, 
is actually 48,000. But anyway, roughly you're, you're, you need to get high enough that you can capture the signal well. All right. So I have some. Uh, so what I've done in this script is I've read in this sound. Uh, first of all, it's stereo, and so I got rid of stereo by just averaging the two together to make mono. I'd rather just deal with one, one signal. Okay, I've labeled time using the sample frequency so I can plot, I can plot it versus time, and that's what this thing is right here. So I've plotted a segment of it. I, I cut out, actually, it's too long. I didn't want to deal with the entire sound. So I just cut out second, the 20th second to the 25th second. Okay, so five seconds worth from this sound. And I plotted it here. Still too much to take in right now. All right. Um, the red dots I'll explain in a minute. Blue is the plot of the sound. I'll explain the red dots in a minute. Okay. Of course, I can zoom in and do all sorts of stuff. Let me just demonstrate that. So I can zo oops, zoom in and see that, you know, what I want with the sound. I just like we were doing with Audacity. Okay, and then I created some other uh, effects, just some simple things, calculations, did some mathematics of the sound just to demonstrate what it might sound like. Um, so these, so one of the things I did was I took X, X now is that sound segment. I took it and I multiplied it by a sin, sinusoid. Okay, so each point was multiplied by a sinusoid. Uh, the frequency of the sine wave was 1 kilohertz. Okay, so I'm calling that X1. The other thing I did was I clipped the sound. So X2 is, the sound kind of goes from negative 1 to 1. I clipped it off at 0.1 and minus 0.1. Okay, so when it goes above, it just stops. When it goes below, it just stops. Well, let's demonstrate what these things do by listening to them. Uh, first, the actual the actual segment unchanged. Let me I hope it comes out of there. Okay. Yeah, too loud, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what we pulled from the MP3. Now if I multiply it by the sine wave, and by the way, these effects that I'm doing are just I just made them up. I mean they're not like there's not really a reason to do these things, but you might be curious what happens if you do them. Okay, so here I multiplied it by one kilohertz. Okay, so by the way, you will, by the end of this class, be able to sort of predict what it's going to sound like because you'll understand mathematically what happens when you multiply by a sine wave. Okay, so these aren't unrelated to what you'll learn in this class. Here, this is what we call clipping. This is where I cut it off at 0.1 and minus 0.1. Now, you might recognize that as what happens when you turn the volume too loud on bad speakers. It's exact, it does the exact same thing. The speakers clip your sound. Your, if your voltage gets too high, the speaker reaches its limit. Okay. All we did was we synthesized that using in the numbers themselves right, and created that sort of clipping effect. All right. Let's see. But, by the way, it would have been quieter. I guess I should mention, the command I'm using to play the sound back does an automatic gain adjust, so it always tries to make it. That, that should have been much quieter because I, I shrunk the signal down. Uh, just for fun, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I'll take this, the SC part off the command, and it'll just play it without rescaling it. So here's the original. And here's after I flip it. It's only a little quiet. Right. Okay, so then let's uh, let's look at some other things that we've done. Okay, so this is weird. I took the I take the absolute value of of each sample and take the square root. So this is going to do some weird thing where small values are actually going to be kind of amplified, but the bigger ones won't be changed very much. Okay, so let's just see what it sounds like. I'll put the scale back on here. If you're a guitarist, you might appreciate that. <laughs> okay, um, now uh, here I'm going to square it. That's kind of the opposite, right? Of square root. Let's see what happens with x3 or x4.
Okay, now I'm going to get to something a little bit different. Here what I'm going to do is show that what if I wanted to reduce the number of samples that I am recording? Okay, so I have a lot of samples I mentioned, um, and I might want to just store it with much fewer samples. And one way to do that would be just throw out all of them and just take every every other one or however whatever rate I want to subsample at. Okay, so the red dots here represent doing that. Now, if I were to do that, of course, I would reduce the file size to store a song if I don't have to save every sample. But I'm also going to reduce the quality. If I took every other one, you're going to notice that the sound sounds muffled. All right, it's going to lose high frequencies. Um, but and if I took every third and every or every fourth, you're going to notice it more and more. There's a particular effect that happens when you when you subsample. And so to illustrate that effect, I'm going to subsample very extreme rate. I'm going to take every fiftieth sample. Okay. So that's what uh, this code does right here. It means skip, just take every 50th in the time sequence and in the sound. Okay. And, um, and that's what I've graphed here. So every 50th one has a red dot. You can see that a lot of the actual structure of the sound gets kind of lost. Um, like, you know, it's jumping from here to here, up to here, it lost all of the detail of how it, how it gets there, right? So when I play it back, it should not sound the same. Now, there's actually a right way and a wrong way to downsample. This way that I've explained to you, where I just throw things away and just, you know, take every 50th one, is the wrong way, all right? And so when you listen to it, you're going to hear, it, it's going to sound terrible either way, because I'm downsampling a factor of 50, but you're going to hear a particular artifact that occurs because I did it this way. So let me show you first. Um, so I have two, two vectors here. I have x5, that's this one in red. And then I have x5 resampled, and that uses a built-in resample tool. And, and we know exactly how it works, but it's just easier to use their tool um, to create a downsampled version. But it's not going to be exactly the same as these red dots. It's going to get rid of this, this artifact called aliasing. I'm going to play that one first so you hear what what it should sound like done properly. Of course, it's going to still sound pretty awful, but not as bad. Okay, so let me put, let me, just to get it fresh in your mind, I'll play the original. Okay, now here's when I've downsampled. It's going to sound very muffled. You're only going to hear very low stuff. Okay. Similar to low-pass filter, right? but here's what happens if you just do it the naive down sample. So you just took every 50th sample. Okay. Okay, so you can hear it's not only did you lose stuff, but you got a bunch of stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. Okay, that's what aliasing does. If you do it the wrong way, if you just down, just throw out stuff. You get this aliasing where sounds that were never there are, are all of a sudden there. Okay, and you can avoid that, and you can at least do it the proper way, where you lose something but you don't get new garbage in there. Okay. Okay. Let's um, change pace a little bit and just talk about the logistics of the class a little bit. Um, before I do this, any questions about stuff we've done? I haven't been asking. You know. Allowing you guys time for questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're going to learn that, exactly. It does, yep. Everything we do is pretty much going to have to do with the frequency domain, and the sampling properly is a very important thing that we'll learn. How do you do it in the first place? Because even when you take the samples at the microphone, you shouldn't, do, you shouldn't just measure a sample every, you know, at, at 44 kilohertz. You should first have a circuit in front of it that does a low-pass filter. We'll learn about how, how to properly sample, how to properly downsample. Yeah. OK, anything else? All right, so the class website, which hopefully you're aware of, a Blackboard links over to here. Um, let me just go through some of the information. We've talked about what the class is about. You're going to have, uh, let's see, 
Here's my information. I have office hours after class on Thursdays. We have some lovely teaching assistants that are here with us today. Would they stand up? All right. Yeah. Uh, just each of you can introduce yourself. Okay, thanks. Great. And we have one more. Hey, he's not here today, though. Jewel. Um, now, uh, have any of you TA'd this class before? Who? So, Deborah and Sai TA'd it last year. And actually, Jewel, who's not here, TA'd a few years ago. The class was different um, back then, but, but anyway. Everyone's very experienced in this stuff. Um, we have, Sai will have office hours weekly in his office. So he'll be available, door unlocked, go in and find him if you have questions. Those are on Tuesdays at 4.30. Um, we will also have another office hour that where the, the person who holds the office hour will rotate. That'll be on Fridays because everything is due Friday. Okay. <laughs> so um, to communicate with them or me, use Piazza. Um, has anyone not used Piazza before? Okay, so as you sign up for free, I have a link to it down here. And basically, uh, it'll, we'll, we'll be checking it frequently, but that way, um, one of us can answer your question. You don't have to decide who to ask it to. And there's other students can answer the questions too. Okay, you can also send private notes if you're, if you're shy about what you're asking. That'll just go to the instructor. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, we will only use Blackboard for handing back uh, grades and stuff like that. Otherwise, I'm not going to put, like, syllabus up there or anything. It's all on this website. There's a book that you should buy, Signals and Systems by Oppenheim and Wilski. Um, the first homework assignment does not use this. Uh, I mean, you can, you know, just take our PDF from online, but we may in the future assign that up here so you have a week to go ahead and get the book if you don't have it yet. We'll give you some reading. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you which pages in this go along with the lectures. Okay, this is a very common book to use uh, to study this material. Um, okay, you all are signed up for lab sessions. Oh, you can sit down if you'd like. Okay, you're all signed up for lab sessions. Um, let me point out there are four lab sessions, and Tuesday evening that's the one that's kind of full, right? Yeah, Tuesday evening is full. Wednesday, I mean Monday evening is much more empty. And I encourage some of you on Tuesday evening to move over to Monday. You'll get more individual attention from the TAs. Okay, So if it's not a schedule conflict, please consider switching over to Monday rather than be in a crowded 20-person lab on Tuesday. Okay, And if you do switch, please actually go and change it and uh, score so that we can see who's coming which nights. All right, so the way the labs work, let me just go to that here. We've got... Um, so we have problem sets and labs, um, and they're due alternating Fridays. Okay. Um, so that means the lab, even though we have lab sessions every week, you turn them in every other week. All right. And the, um, you know, it's possible to get ahead in the first week if you want to do the second week. I mean, the TAs will be uh, familiar with what you're going to do the next week in the lab and so forth. Um, so, one thing I should mention about these labs, I have them up, but these are from last year, and I'm making some changes. So, the, the content is correct, but if you but on the day of the lab, if you come with it printed out, print out, make sure you print it that day, just in case we've changed some things, okay? Um, but if you look at it now and want to kind of get started, that's not going to be a problem. The content's going to be pretty much the same. Um, okay, we have problem sets, and I already have your first problem set up here. It's due next Friday. Okay. Um, so we'll have about five of these graded, maybe six graded, and then and then one will be available midterm week, but we won't have you hand that in. Okay. Um, I am going to be using this setup um, where I write on the tablet, like I have been here, and then I'm going to make those notes available online. So if you don't like to write it down, that's okay. You can download it from the web page. I still have all of last year's stuff here. And uh, 
it's in PDF form and you can you can use it and I'll be updating it with this year's notes as each lecture goes on. Okay, two things to point out here. We have lecture canceled next Tuesday. There'll be no lecture. And then in week four on Thursday, there'll be no lecture. Okay, so don't come those days. The couple places where you'll be reminded of this one is right here on the schedule. And another one is I have a calendar in case you want to add this to your own Google Calendar. Um, that uh, shows that we have lecture canceled then, lecture canceled then. Okay, it also says when the problem sets and labs are due, when the office hours are and stuff like that. A Google Calendar for you. Okay. Um, what else? Grading policy. We have uh, this percentage breakdown for the grades. So I guess that's everything. Um, now we have some other texts. So Kokarni used to teach this class. He did a great job, and he had. Um, why is that so slow? He had. Um, he he created some text. We, although we won't follow it chapter by chapter, it's the same material, and it can be useful as a second text to look at. It's all available online on the web page. Okay. Um, any other questions? Are any questions about the class? Yeah? Oh, I haven't updated the exact day. So that should be, it'll be February though. What? Oh, right there. Yeah. Okay. That's not due February 7th. Yeah. The, so, okay, so this page needs some work, but the um, the actual, I did update, if you go to schedule and you look on the calendar, wow, how come this is not <coughs> behaving? Huh, I'm not getting a connection. If you look on the calendar, I did put the accurate days. I mean, basically, your first thing is homework next Friday, and then it's going to go lab, homework, lab, homework. The only time it's confusing is when we go to break in midterm and, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, other questions? All right, I have something else to cover. We're not quite done. All right, so if there are no questions about that. I think I talked about everything there I wanted to. Let me just hi uh, just highlight, you know, just advertise some of the cool labs you will do. I lost this page, so, oh, it's there. So Shazam. Uh, many of you might have the Shazam app on your phone. It identifies music, right? You, you, you say go, and if there's music playing, it'll listen for five to ten seconds, and it'll say, this is the song by this singer. Um, so that we are going to do a simple version of that in MATLAB. We're going to take a smaller set of songs, five to ten songs. We're going to do the same signal processing that Shazam does. They, they have a paper explaining what they do. We're going to go through... And we're going to do it in MATLAB, which, which means we're going to go um, process each song, pull out some fingerprint that uses the tools of this class, the Fourier transform, and then we're going to figure out how to match that to the song we're trying to identify, and it'll be fun. You'll be able to identify songs, um, have your own little mini Shazam. Okay. Um, and then uh, aside from that, I want to point out that we have a cool MP3 lab. Psy actually developed this last year. And uh, we'll continue to develop it because um, the idea is to understand what MP3 actually is doing. Um, you know, many of you may not even recognize that MP3 was at one point a breakthrough of compression, audio compression, and being able to save a song using one tenth the amount of file size and still sound full quality. All right, and um, so we go. Th we we have a lab where you go through and you learn the steps of MP3 and how it actually works on encoding and decoding. Okay. All right, so the last thing I want to do is a, a um, we need to talk about complex numbers. All right, so we have a little 10 minutes here. Okay, this is going to be something that will be pervasive in this course you're going to be using. Complex numbers, the Fourier transform is built around using these. So let's just make sure, let's do some review and make sure we're all on solid footing. 
we'll start from the very beginning, okay? That we have such a thing as a square root of negative one. Um, and in real numbers, you don't have such a thing. But if you want to give it a name, you can say, well, let that thing be i. And we can actually do some cool stuff with these imaginary numbers. There are always in intermediate steps. In reality, every signal is going to be real numbers, right? A sensor is going to give you real numbers. But it turns out that if we delve into this intermediate land where we use imaginary numbers, we end up getting real answers and we take a simpler path. All right. So, of course, you have things like this. Um, so then, so this is imaginary, right? the imaginary number. And then you have complex numbers is just the general term for a number that may have a real component and an imaginary component. Okay, so you might have the number like 1 plus i. That's a complex number, and that's one way to, to state it, the real part and the imaginary part. Real part, imaginary part. Okay, now, okay, now you also, um, of course, you can do simple uh, math with these numbers. It's pretty obvious how you do things like addition. Okay, so if you have like 2 plus 3i as one number, one complex number, and you want to add something like minus 1 plus i, then you just add the real parts and add the imaginary parts separate. Pretty straightforward. All right, so 1 plus 4i is your answer. And we actually have what we call the complex plane as a way to graphically plot complex numbers. All right. um, so here's the complex plane. We have the real part on one axis and the imaginary part on another. And uh, so the number 1, for example, would be here. And the number i would be there. And this would be negative i. And this would be negative 1. And as far as addition and subtraction are concerned, this is exactly like any other two-dimensional vector space. Adding complex numbers is just like adding vectors. For example, these two numbers that we added here, we had a we had 2 plus 3i, something up here. And we had a minus 1 plus i, something here. And you could think of these as vectors, and you just added them up, and that was pretty straightforward. All right, and you ended up here put the two vectors at end or whatever. Okay, so it's simple to understand addition and subtraction complex numbers, but when we get to multiplication, we're going to need to think about how to how to do it properly. So multiplying So multiplication of course can also be done just like we do any binomials. You can multiply these two things. Whoops, times And we do what? Maybe you remember FOIL as the acronym for multiplying out binomials. Okay, first inner out or last. Okay, so we get a minus 2. Um, let's do a minus 3i uh, plus 2i and then minus 3. Why minus 3? Uh, because i squared is minus 1. Okay, so this equals negative 5 minus i. Okay, so that was easy. But interpreting it in the complex plane using that step is not so obvious. Okay, So we, went, we multiplied these two numbers and we end up with a number way over here. Negative 5 minus i. We end up with this thing. Right? And it may not be clear how did you get from these two numbers over to there? And that's what I want to express right now, how it is very easy to understand geometrically what happens when you multiply and divide. And this comes to Euler's wonderful identity. Okay, Euler shows us that e to the i t 
equals, well, this is, the exponent is imaginary, right? Um, and we can write it as a sum of a real part and a imaginary part this way. Cosine of t plus i sine of t. Again, here's the real part, and here's the imaginary part. Okay, and you could rewrite Euler's identity in other ways. So you could start with cosine and end up with a sum of exponentials and, and so forth. Very useful identity because multiplication is very nice and easy for, for exponential functions. Okay, so what this means is that we can interpret What this means is that um, a number, we have a number written, sorry, that's not T, that's real, imaginary. Okay, if we write a number in polar uh, coordinates, we, can, we write it this way, we say, a, I'll use a capital A, e to the i theta. And any complex number can be written this way. Well, we know from, from Euler's identity that this is just A cosine theta plus A i a sine theta, which means that this number is exactly represented in the complex plane. It's at the location where the angle from the real line is theta and the length of the line is a. Okay. So why do we know that? Well, we know that because the real part here is a cosine theta and the imaginary part is a sine theta. Okay. So, at polar coordinates, that's another. It's also easy to figure out where the point is in the complex plane. But the the nice part is that when you have it represented that way, let's do multiplication again. Oops, sorry. It's a thin black line. So multiplication now. If I have a uh, one cosine i theta one times my other number, oh, whoops, yeah, thanks, e to the i theta 1 times e to the i theta 2, okay? Of course, I'm just going to get a 1, a 2, e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. So multiplication is easy to understand. You multiply the lengths, and you add their angles. So we can go back up here to our example where we multiplied these two numbers this and this, and we got that. And you can see that the length, that's, uh, well, you can see roughly anyway, that this could feasibly be the product of those two lengths. That one's almost length, that one's a little more than length one. Okay, not much. And that the angles, you add the two angles, add this angle and add this angle, and you get all the way to this angle. So, so this and this, and you get to this third angle, which is this one. Okay. This also gives you a very convenient way to do, say, square roots or cube roots. As an example, probably the last thing we'll be able to do here um, is that you can say, what is the cube root of minus 1? Someone tell me the cube root of minus 1. What? Negative 1. Is that all? No. There's three of them. And here's how we're going to get them. We're going to do this. Um, we're going to put minus 1 here in the complex plane. And we're going to ask for something that can be multiplied by itself three times to get negative 1. Okay. Now, the length of this is 1. right? The magnitude in polar coordinates is 1. So we could... Oh, Okay, so this is 1. All right, so we can write negative 1 equals 1 e to the i pi. Okay, so, and it also equals um, 
1 e to the i 3 pi. If you go around the circle 3 pi angle, you get to the same spot. When we take this, the cube root, the cube root of 1 is just 1. So the cube root of minus 1 is going to be, let's take any of these, we'll, we'll start with this one here. There's minus 1, take the cube root. Notice that if we do 1 e to the i pi over 3, when we cube that, we'll get negative 1. Okay. The second one, if we do that second one, we'll get the one you're familiar with. That equals 1 e to the i uh, 3 pi over 3 equals 1 e to the i pi equals negative 1. So that's the one you're familiar with. And the, the reason I drew this graph was just to show if I can get it to stay. Was that um, clearly negative 1 is a cube root of negative 1 because if I take this angle and I triple it, I go around three times, I go around like this, I get back to negative 1, right? But these other cube roots, this one here is going to be some point right here. And the third cube root is going to be some point over here. That's also distance 1. They're, they're all going to be distance 1 because when you cube them, the, the magnitude is going to be cubed, right? But this is going to be one third of, so this, this angle here, theta is going to equal pi over 3. And it's still going to be a cube root of negative 1. So now we see there are actually three cube roots of negative 1 if we use complex numbers. Right. Okay. I had a couple formulas I was going to put up, but we'll do it next time. So. All right. Thank you. See you on Thursday.